Okay, so the term mineral corticoid and glucocorticoid are used to classify steroids. The term steroids actually refers to hormones produced in the body that are derived from cholesterol. So example of these include testosterone, estrogens, and corticosteroids. But in clinical practice, when we say steroids, we are usually referring to corticosteroids, and that will be the focus of this video. Corticosteroids are hormones produced by the adrenal glands. It's one of those organs that many people forget where it's located. It sits right on top of the kidneys. Now, if we take a cross section of the adrenal gland, there are two main parts you should know of, the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla. Our focus will be the adrenal cortex. The adrenal cortex is divided into three parts. Each part is responsible for the production of certain hormones. There is the zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona reticularis. The zona glomerulosa is where the mineral corticoids are produced. The zona fasciculata is where the glucocorticoids are produced and zona reticularis produces androgens like testosterone. Mineral corticoids and glucocorticoids are both a type of corticosteroid. Example of a mineral corticoid is aldosterone and an example of a glucocorticoid is cortisol. I included their chemical structure so you can see how similar they look. They are like brothers, and we will see later on that they have some overlapped functions. Let's begin with mineral corticoids. The primary function of mineral corticoids is to regulate electrolytes and water in the body. It does this by working at the kidneys, leading to sodium reabsorption back into the blood and promoting the excretion of potassium. The effect of aldosterone is called upon when there is low blood pressure low blood volume and low sodium. When this happens, the body activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system or RAS. When this system is activated, the juxtaglomerular cells in the kidneys release renin. Angiotensinogen from the liver is converted into angiotensin 1 by renin. Angiotensin 1 is then converted to angiotensin 2 by the angiotensin converting enzyme ACE. Angiotensin 2 stimulates the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. Aldosterone will then increase the sodium reabsorption, and then water will follow sodium, which will increase the blood pressure. I'll not cover in detail, but when potassium levels are high, aldosterone is produced and released to promote the excretion of potassium in the kidneys. And when there's an increased blood pressure and volume, the body responds to this by inhibiting aldosterone secretion and renin release to reduce the blood pressure. As mentioned previously, an example of a glucocorticoid is cortisol. In order for it to exert these effects, it needs to be released into the blood. So let's learn about how cortisol is normally regulated by the body. The regulation is primarily controlled by the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or HPA axis, which is a classic uh, negative feedback system. And here's how it works. In order for the HPA axis to activate, there needs to be some kind of stress. This can be physiological stress like fear, sadness or anxiety, physical stress like an injury, pain, um, physiological or internal stress like low blood sugar and infection or low oxygen levels. And it can also be activated due to the body's circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm is a natural internal process that regulates the sleep-wake cycle and other physiological processes over a roughly 24-hour period. It is influenced mainly by light and darkness in the environment and it helps synchronize the body's functions with day and night cycle. So cortisol levels peak in the morning to prepare the body to wake up and be active. So once stress is detected, the hypothalamus releases the corticotropin releasing hormone, CRH. CRH will travel to the anterior pituitary gland, promoting it to release adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. ACTH will stimulate the adrenal cortex to produce and release cortisol into the bloodstream. Once cortisol is in the bloodstream, what does it do? First, cortisol increases the blood glucose levels through a process known as gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is the metabolic process by which the body produces glucose from non 
carbohydrate sources like proteins and fat. The reason why cortisol does this is because remember, cortisol is a stress hormone. So its goal is to prepare your body for stressful situations like a physical threat. So cortisol prepares the body for action by ensuring a readily available energy source like glucose is in the bloodstream. Next, cortisol suppresses inflammation by reducing the production of inflammatory cytokines, inhibits immune cell activity, mainly T cells, but can also suppress B cell antibody production and reduce neutrophil migration during inflammation. Cortisol plays a significant role in regulating blood pressure. Again, it's a stress hormone, so it's involved in the fight or flight response when under a stressful situation. It does this in different ways. Cortisol can increase the body's sensitivity to vasoconstrictor hormones like norepinephrine and angiotensin 2. This means that the blood vessels will become more responsive to the substances, leading to increased constriction and higher blood pressure. Cortisol can also increase the cardiac output, which can increase the blood pressure. There's one more way in which cortisol regulates blood pressure. Remember, I was saying previously that the cortisol is structurally similar to aldosterone. Yep. So because of this, it can act like aldosterone and bind to aldosterone receptors, leading to sodium retention and potassium excretion. This only occurs with certain conditions like Cushing's syndrome, when there is excess cortisol, which is able to overcome the body's mechanism that normally prevents cortisol from binding to aldosterone receptors. Next, cortisol inhibits bone formation and inhibits collagen synthesis. It inhibits bone formation by decreasing osteoblast activity and increase in osteoclast activity. Cortisol also modulates mood, cognition, and alertness. It does this by altering the levels of neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine. It also affects parts of the brain, which will lead to improved alertness, enhanced focus, memory, and improved attention and learning. Now that we understand the roles that both glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids play in the body, we can learn about some of the corticosteroids on the market. Please note that these drugs can have both mineral corticoid and glucocorticoid activity, but at different levels. Here is a list of the common corticosteroids in the market. I'm sure you've seen or heard of most of these agents before. Next, let's look at the glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid activity. From there, it will be easy to outline the indications and make sense of it. Let's begin with betamethasone, which has excellent glucocorticoid activity with practically no mineral corticoid activity. This also applies to dexamethasone. Cortisone and hydrocortisone have a balanced glucocorticoid activity and mineral corticoid activity. Flugocortisone has an excellent mineral corticoid activity and some decent glucocorticoid activity, but it's really used in clinical practice for its mineral corticoid activity. Methylprednisolone has some acceptable glucocorticoid activity with little mineral corticoid activity which is also lower than prednisolone. Now, prednisolone is the active form of prednisone. Prednisone also has a balanced glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid activity. Lastly, triamcinolone, which is used for its glucocorticoid activity because of the minimal negligible mineral corticoid activity. Based on the glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid activity of these agents, let's see what diseases and conditions we use them for in clinical practice. So acute inflammatory allergic conditions like anaphylaxis, asthma exacerbations, COPD exacerbations, autoimmune inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, GI disorders like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, dermatologic and ophthalmologic disorders, uveitis, contact dermatitis, and psoriasis. For these conditions, the goal is to really reduce the inflammation. So agents with glucocorticoid activity and a little to no mineral corticoid activities are preferred. So agents like cortisone, hydrocortisone, methylprednisolone, prednisolone, and triamcinolone are utilized. Why one would be picked over the other may depend on the onset of action, duration of action, and the formulation that it comes in. Other conditions like adrenal insufficiency or Addison's disease or congenital adrenal hyperplasia where the adrenal gland fails to produce cortisol and sometimes aldosterone. We can use drugs like hydrocortisone, flugocortisone, which provide both glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid effects, essential for replacing cortisol and aldosterone. Neuroconditions like cerebral edema, we use dexamethasone for its potent 
and glucocorticoid activity and minimal mineral corticoid activity, reducing the risk of fluid retention, which can possibly exacerbate the condition. Lastly, let's discuss some side effects of both mineral corticoid and glucocorticoids. For the mineral corticoids, patients develop hypertension due to the sodium water retention, hyperkalemia from the potassium excretion, and peripheral edema, again because of the sodium water retention. Side effects of glucocorticoids include hyperglycemia due to the gluconeogenesis, osteoporosis due to the inhibition of osteoblasts, which reduces the ability to produce new bone matrix. It also increases the activity of osteoclasts, leading to an increase in bone breakdown. Glucocorticoids also interfere with calcium absorption in the GI, reducing the amount available for bone formation. We learned previously that glucocorticoids have an anti-inflammatory effect by decreasing immune activity. This is seen with long-term use, which leads to more significant suppression of the immune system. The general accepted threshold for significant immunosuppression is prednisone or equivalent. 20 milligrams or more per day for two or more weeks is considered immunosuppressive doses. Glucocorticoids can cause mood swings due to influence of brain neurotransmitters and and receptor function, especially dopamine and serotonin. The mood swings range from mild euphoria and anxiety to psychosis. The mild symptoms are mostly seen with the acute use. Next, insomnia especially when taken in moderate to high doses or late in the day. This side effect is due to the uh, stimulatory effects on the central nervous system. Because glucocorticoids inhibit prostaglandin that protects the stomach, these agents can contribute to gastric ulcer formation. A proton pump inhibitor, PPI like omeprazole or H2 blocker like ranitidine can be prescribed in high-risk patients. Cataracts and also glaucoma due to alteration of the aqueous humor and protein aggregation in the eye are also potential side effects. Next, weight gain and fat redistribution are also very common, especially with chronic use. This is due to the ability to stimulate appetite and promote insulin resistance. Lastly, adrenal suppression or HPA axis suppression, which is a serious side effect of exogenous glucocorticoid therapy, especially when taken for long durations or at high doses. I want to cover this in a separate video so I can go over the significance of this and why it's recommended to taper steroids um, because of this. So look out for the next video. Okay, thank you for watching this video. I hope you're now able to distinguish between mineral corticoid and glucocorticoid activities of the corticosteroids that we usually see on the market. If you have any questions, please leave it down below. Thank you for watching this video and take care.